welcome to Alberta, Western Canada, home to glorious rolling foothills, the Canadian Rockies, and widespread wilderness. It's destination Edmonton, city of champions, the provincial capital, gateway to Canada's oil sands, and venue for the staging of the IRB Women's Rugby World Cup. Twelve teams and 300 players journeyed from all around the globe to compete in the most prestigious event in the women's game. Some travelled in hope, others in expectation. There was pride and passion, thrills and spills, joy and sorrow, agony and ecstasy. The USA won the first ever Women's Rugby World Cup in 1991. England won it four years later. In 98, New Zealand got their hands on the trophy and then again in 2002. Would they make it a hat-trick of wins, or could someone stop them in their tracks? This is the story of the 2006 Women's Rugby World Cup. The tournament launch took place at Winston Churchill Square, where hopes were high for the first Women's World Cup to be held outside Europe. It's a matter of pride that Canada can always say that we were the first to hold an event such as this outside. and. I think North America is generally seen in the, the eyes of world rugby as a, a huge untapped market with vast potential. So if we're the launching pad to bigger and better things in North America, it's not only good for the women, it's good for all of rugby. We know we're going to have a good event. These girls have come up a notch since the Women's Rugby World Cup in 2002. They're fitter, they're stronger, they've got some superb uh, uh, coaches who can help them to take the, take the women's, women's game to the next level. Each time we've had the World Cups, the level of uh, game skill and, and intensity has improved. I'm hoping that all of the women's teams play such excellent rugby that people do take notice, the IRB and all of the national unions back home as well. It's a World Cup, you know, that's what everyone dreams of doing, either going to the Olympics or being in a World Cup, so it's going to be a lovely tournament. The tournament took place over a period of two and a half weeks. All 12 teams would play three qualifying games with four points for a win and one for a draw. An extra bonus point would be on offer to teams scoring four tries or more in any single game or by keeping to within a seven point margin of defeat. At the conclusion of the qualifying stages, the top four ranked sides would then progress into the semi-finals. Teams were seeded depending upon how they fared in the last World Cup. So reigning champions New Zealand were top seeds with 2002 runners-up England ranked at number two. 2002 bronze medalist France were seeded third and hosts Canada were fourth. The tournament also welcomed newcomers, 11 seeds South Africa who were making their World Cup debut. Day one of the tournament and the final few touches were being put in place at Ellerslie Rugby Club just in time for kickoff. And it was appropriate that the opening match was between host nation Canada and the reigning champions New Zealand. The Black Ferns had only been in the country for a matter of days but if the Canadians had hoped that they might catch their opposition off guard they were very much mistaken. New Zealand got off to a flyer with their two wings doing the damage. Claire Richardson touched down in the corner in only the second minute of the game before Stephanie Mortimer put the finishing touches on some brilliant work from fullback Amaria Marsh. Seven minutes gone and the home side were already two scores down. Scrum half Julia Sugawara briefly gave the local crowd something to cheer about with a well-worked try, but that was as good as it got for Canada's loyal fans. In the second half, Richardson scored her second and third tries of the game, before Marsh, the outstanding player on the pitch, wrapped things up for New Zealand with a brilliant individual try. An ominous start for those hoping to dethrone the world champions. We just went out, just played our natural game. Um, probably, you know, there's still a little bit of stuff to work on, but you know, the girls did awesome. Scotland launched their campaign with victory over Spain. 
Rona Shepherd's second half try after strong play from fly half Erin Kerr put the Scots well clear before scrum half and captain Paula Chalmers finished the game off in style with her team's fourth try right on full time. And Samoa were thankful for the efforts of Valuisi Sao Taliu in their victory over Kazakhstan on match day one. The fullback scoring two of her side's three tries in a comfortable win. South Africa's World Cup debut turned into a baptism of fire. Although Zalisa Nekseki and Mandisa Williams scored their country's first ever World Cup tries, Australia, who themselves were playing their first test match since the last World Cup, responded with ten of their own. And it was the team's two wingers who shared seven of the tries between them. Trisha Brown scored a hat-trick but was upstaged by her colleague Ruan Sims, who managed to go one better. France had little difficulty in overcoming Ireland, with captain Estelle Sartini at the centre of most of the action. Sartini first chipped over the top for Catherine Devier to score, and then added a try of her own for good measure. That's it, well done. Pull down on the rope. Far from taking it easy in their build-up, England chose to put themselves through an arduous final few days with the Royal Marines, an approach the squad hoped would pay off as they looked to scale their own Everest. We want to win. We want to win the World Cup. Just get yourself to the top, nice and flat. Having come second <laughs> once, we don't want to do that again, and uh, so there's huge expectation there. In 2002, England were beaten in the final by New Zealand when there had been genuine belief that it was to be their year. But it was the manner of the defeat, as much as the defeat itself, which was cause for regret. The players that did uh, play in the 2002 final were, were disappointed with their performance because they know they could have played a lot better. For some, though, the pain of 2002 was much greater. Both Helen Clayton and Jenny Sutton were part of the squad. Both were dropped for the final. Better to have played and lost than never to have played at all. It was the hardest thing I ever did, which, watching the final from the sideline. Um, but it inspired me to keep playing. In many ways, it's why I'm here now. It drives you. That's a driving force to keep you training and keep you working hard. So next time it won't happen again. And England's most capped player and sole survivor of the 1994 Cup winning squad was certain the 2006 recruits had all the ingredients to help wipe away the memory of 2002. Four years later, four years wiser, four years stronger. I can compare it to quite a few teams and the 94 pack was awesome and this pack is, is awesome. We've got strength all the way across the park, and uh, you know, which is a huge advantage because we can play any style that we want to play. I think we've got good strength uh, up front, and we've we've got you know pace in the backs. Morale is so high at the moment, and everyone's got confidence in every position at the moment. There's no one you 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 have any doubts in whatsoever. Come on, last couple. The group I've played with in the last couple of years, in particular, have been extraordinary group of athletes best group of athletes I've ever played with. Sutton and Clayton would be retiring at the end of the tournament, so there was only one way to sign off, in style. I think it's the best way to finish. Finish a long career with uh, being world champion. Start it in 94, being a world champion, and finish it in 2006, being a world champion. Team six. Yeah! It feels like it is the right conclusion to a long journey for me. Absolutely feels like it's going to happen. We've done everything uh, possible to, to uh, give us the, most, the best possible chance of winning. So uh, now it's up to the girls to get out there and, uh, and strut their stuff. With their coaches' words ringing in their ears, there was a steely determination in the eyes of the England team as they readied themselves for match one. But early on, they didn't have it their own way against a very physical United States team and soon lost fly half Karen Andrew to injury. No points on the board at half-time, things needed to improve. And they did. In the second half, England slowly managed to gain control of the game and eventually turned their possession into points. Kim Oliver set the ball rolling with her first ever try in her 17th appearance and was then instrumental in England's second touchdown. 
Having made a wonderful break, she was well supported by her forwards. The ball was then recycled for Rochelle Clark to cross the line. With only two tries though, England had crucially failed to pick up a bonus point. But after a tough first game, the captain was just relieved to have started with a win. We knew the USA were going to be a really tough game and, you know, and they didn't disappoint. You know, we had to fight for every inch out there. They, their physicality was immense and you know, um, to, come, to come through at the end and, um, and to get the victory that we did, you know, we're really pleased. New Zealand's huge win meant they led the table, closely followed by neighbours Australia. France and Scotland were the only other teams to pick up bonus points from round one. After the break, we have the best of the action from rounds two and three, catch up with the most capped player, and make a date with the game's latest celebrities. You want my autograph? Glamorous, elegant, striking, sexy words you rarely associate with rugby, but that was before the Canadian team came up with something that had everyone talking. It's great, it's exciting the girls are promoting their sport. Meet the Calendar Girls. The idea was brought up a couple years ago, 2004, 2004 we did it as well, and um, it, it was beyond our expectation for a fundraiser for our team, so it was very, very successful being the World Cup year, we thought it was a great opportunity to take it and go with it again. Many national unions struggle to finance the women's game, so the World Cup calendar was an ingenious way to generate some much needed funds and the girls have been delighted with the response. It's not what I was envisioning, it was really good, yeah. yeah. And that's what we got from feedback from people who have purchased it, it's like, this is very, it's a very well done calendar. Tasteful. Yeah, and tasteful. So. It's, it's artwork instead of <laughs> something the other. Yeah. I was in London, England and opened the Metro and I saw my teammate Colette naked. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on? My sister Erica is August. When it first started, it's like, you want my autograph? <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, sure. It, it's a bit surreal to you that it's kind of that people actually want your autograph. But in front of their home fans in round one, the Canadians were far from picture perfect. Instead, they froze on the big stage against an intimidating Black Ferns unit. We were on television and our families all across the country were watching and it was a bit of a shock. I personally was pretty excited to face New Zealand first off before they had a chance to like, um, play more games and get that cohesion, team cohesion, and probably build. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. looks like they didn't need to get that team cohesion when they played us. I think as a whole, as a team, we were disappointed with the outcome mm -hmm. um, because we went out there believing in ourselves and believing that it was going to be a better result. I would be more worried if we did perform well and we lost by that margin. The fact that we performed poorly and lost by that margin means that if our paths cross again, I think we can redeem ourselves. And so minds quickly turned to their next match against Spain when the team knew that nothing less than a big result would do if they were to maintain any hopes of making it into the semi-finals. Our goal heading into this World Cup was to better fourth position and it's going to be difficult to do that but it's still possible. We're mostly looking as a team just to perform, have fun, play together, enjoy it and then hopefully the points will come from that. We feel that we can play better and we, well not, we don't feel, we know we can play better and we will play better. The girls had well and truly left their mark off the pitch but could they now transfer it onto the field of play? Their attempt to get back on track in round two took place at St Albert Rugby Club. Spain, Spain, go away. Canada's going to win today. It's our day. It's our day. Prophetic words indeed, and in front of a vociferous home crowd, the Canadians made their intentions very clear from the outset. Good interplay between Heather Moyes and Maria E. Gallo allowed the latter to cross for the team's first try of the game with only a minute on the clock. After that, it was clear the Canadians simply had too much for their Spanish opposition as they ran in 13 tries. 
Gallo eventually ending up with a total of five that did much to help her country pick up the additional bonus point. The victory put a smile back on the fans' faces and the team back in contention for a semi-final spot. All in all, a much better day at the office. We were told by our coaches today not to focus on the results, to just do small things one at a time and then the win would come. So that's what we wanted to focus, not too far ahead, but the bonus po points are usually a good thing. The second round of pool games also threw up an intriguing match between reigning champions New Zealand and their Pacific Island neighbours, Samoa. It's a historical match, the first time uh, Samoa have played uh, New Zealand in a test match. Um, you probably got your normal uh, match day uh, nerves, but we've um, yeah, we've prepared the team um, in a way that, uh, that hopefully they're, they're not going to get uh, too overly nervous. You know the opposition, so it's a bit more awkward. All the girls playing today for Samoa play in New Zealand, and obviously play with a lot of my players. So the key for us is really to ignore any sort of friendly rivalries, if you like. But in saying that, I know that Samoan girls, you know, they, they've got a feel of where our weaknesses are, perhaps, perceived, and um, they'll try and exploit some of those areas. So it'll be interesting for us, really, to find out whether they can find some weaknesses. Understandably, perhaps, the Samoans chose not to face up to the Black Ferns Haka in an attempt to maintain focus on the match ahead. Once the game kicked off, though, the Samoans had no choice but to face up. And if they'd hoped to make early inroads, the plan failed, as Samoa almost inevitably ran into a solid black wall. As Samoa ran out of ideas, New Zealand took control. Victoria Blackledge's first try of the game opened the floodgates, and the Black Ferns went on to score another five first-half tries without reply. Once again, the hugely talented Amaria Marsh was centre of attention, with a hat-trick in the opening 40 minutes of play. New Zealand then added more salt to Samoa's wounds by scoring a further three tries in the second half, including this final touchdown from the World Cup veteran Anna Richards. But it wasn't all good news for New Zealand, who suffered the loss of prop Melody Natai with a broken ankle. It was the end of her tournament and the only downside in another comprehensive display from the top seeds. We wanted to play a, a fast game um, and be accurate with it. And um, I think this too, you know, when it's when you score a couple, you, you relax a little bit as well. Um, but you know, we we really wanted to be accurate with what we were doing today and try and take it up a peg from uh, where we left um, Canada. So again, we'll you know take that win, but we're looking forward to the next one as well. Scotland also maintained their unbeaten tournament record with victory over Kazakhstan in round two. A second half try from the Russian-born Rima Petlovania put the Scots clear. But they still needed a fourth try to ensure they picked up the crucial bonus point and that duly arrived on the stroke of full time, courtesy of Rona Shepherd on her 50th international appearance. I'm extremely pleased with how they dug in. They, they showed a lot of character. They, they had set themselves a target of four tries to get the bonus point. Uh, it wasn't easy and they had to keep working right to the end, but uh, they were rewarded for their efforts and uh, we got the four tries and we got the bonus point, and so they de were delighted with that. After defeat at the hands of England in round one, the United States picked up their first win of the competition with victory over Ireland. Flanker Fedra Knight scoring two of her team's four tries. The Australian supporters may well have had the edge over their French counterparts in the stands. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said for the Australian team, who were unable to make it two wins on the bounce. They came up against a stronger, fitter and better organised French team, for whom Catherine Devier scored a brace, taking her tournament total to five. And a try for France. And number two seeds England look much more at home in their second match against South Africa. In a clinical display, the women in white ran in 12 tries. Stand-in captain Sue Day was in irrepressible form, touching down on four occasions, while inside centre Rachel Burford's try under the posts made it an England debut to remember for the girl from Henley. I think we've got a few more patterns together today. I think the, um, a lot of the set plays went, you know, went to hand, just that, that kind of thing. We're still, you know, there's still a few things to work on, errors here and there, but um, yeah, things went to hand a bit more. 
New Zealand's second emphatic win meant that they were virtually guaranteed a semi-final spot. After that, it was a case of picking three from the next six teams. Match day three, and the team showed their support for the IRB's Keep Rugby Clean campaign, aimed at eradicating drug abuse. Then it was down to the business of the final round of pool matches. In the two games that would have no bearing on the top of the table, Ireland picked up their first win of the tournament with victory over South Africa. Jeanette Ferry with one of her side's six tries. And Spain provided the shock of the pool stages by beating Samoa in their final match. Isabel Rodriguez's try late in the second half, sealing the victory for the Spanish. The USA won their second successive match as they defeated Australia in their final game. Pam Kazanke scored her team's second try, but the fact that the States were unable to improve on their try tally meant that they missed out on another bonus point, leaving them outside contention for a semi-final spot. Having destroyed Spain in round two, Canada now needed to maintain that momentum in their final pool match against Kazakhstan. But to be in with a chance of a place in the last four, the Canadians needed to win and win well, ensuring they picked up a bonus point in the process. Heather Moyes' try after only 60 seconds meant the team got just the start they were after. From then on, Canada never looked back, scoring a further six tries, Moyes eventually finishing up with a hat-trick. A big win, but would it be enough? The team would have to wait for the day's last two games before they would know their destiny. The first of those games would be between New Zealand and Scotland. Both teams would go into the game undefeated, but the world's most capped women's player knew her side were massive underdogs. We are realistic, yeah, you know, we'd love to be able to beat them. But, um, I mean, we look at the performances that they've put in for this World Cup, they've, they've, they've been putting sides away comfortably. The New Zealand match would be Donna Kennedy's 93rd cap, an impressive statistic, but one that would guarantee her no favours when it came to team selection. I just take every game as it comes really you know I, I'm, I'm up for selection you know I want to get picked I want to be first choice and you know I, that's the way I look at it I don't look at it as a label and sometimes that's, that's how it gets put on myself but you know I'm, I mean it's a massive honour it's a huge honour to have that. The tournament would bring the curtain down on her 13-year international career during which she'd seen a great deal of progress in the women's game. I remember my first game 93 um, I think I was playing second row at that time I weighed about two or three stones heavier than I do now. You know, I, you know, you had to progress with the game. You know, and that that that's with, with your level of fitness as well. I and mean, if you don't go with the flow of the game, then you, you just won't progress in rugby. And it's just changed in massive amounts. She loves playing rugby, and uh, I think she realises that, like all of us, you're a long time stopped, and uh, she just keeps going. And uh, she's she's uh, you know a real international athlete, and she uh, she's an, an asset to the team because of that. Just the sort of dedication and devotion the whole team would need to show if they were to pull off a huge result. We perform as a team and everybody plays to the, the, the level we know we can play at. Then I think, you know, obviously we want to pull off the win, but, you know, I, I think we can keep within the seven point margin and get that bonus point and then we'll be pleased. Go on, Scotland! The bonus point was a must if Scotland were to guarantee themselves a semi final place. Otherwise, they'd be looking for favours. The most realistic way of picking up that bonus was to keep within a seven-point margin of defeat. And at half-time, it looked good. New Zealand, who had chosen to rest many of their big names, were restricted to a six-points-to-nil lead. But in the second half, New Zealand unleashed their stars, whose impact was immediate. Stephanie Mortimer and Amaria Marsh combined to put Victoria Blackledge over. Agony for the Scotland bench. Mortimer then got her second try of the tournament and made the game safe. A result that meant Canada were now assured of a semi-final spot alongside New Zealand. But the defeat for Scotland and no bonus point meant their fate now rested on the result of the final pool match between England and France. If the French could defeat the second seeds, then the Scots would progress at the expense of the old enemy. For England, it was a simple equation. It's a massive game for us, obviously. Um, if we lose this game, then we're virtually out of contention. So it's a must-win game for us. The players will take care of, uh, of the game and uh, you know, I have full confidence in them. 
The coach's confidence was fully justified. His team showed greater strength and desire from the very start and within eight minutes were rewarded with a try. Great work from Sue Day and Danielle Waterman making her first start of the tournament with the finishing flourish in at the corner. The tone was set. England's forwards completely dominated the French pack. The only surprise was it took them until the 34th minute before they added to their try tally. Once again, Waterman was the beneficiary of more good work from the pack. Number 14, the second try of the game, Daniel Waterman. In the second half, Sue Day added two tries to bring her tournament total up to six, and despite a late French consolation score, there was no denying England a vital win that kept them in the tournament. The girls worked so hard out there. We talked about work rate, we took, talked about urgency, you know, and they really provided out there today. It was a great team effort. Fantastic ever. Okay, what we've got to do now, that's three of five. Yeah, three three down, two to go. Okay, to go. and that's it. Magnificent effort. I thought they uh, went out there with a fairly definite game plan and uh, they stuck to it. And uh, I, I just thought it was a, a very physical contest and uh, all our players stood up, you know, from uh, 1 to 22. So that was, you know, really pleasing. Coming! So while England were contemplating a semi-final appearance, the Scottish camp were beginning to come to terms with the fact that they'd narrowly missed out on that sought-after last four position. We were absolutely devastated. Um, it was a massive game for us today and we needed to get something from it. And uh, we're bitterly disappointed that we didn't uh, take at least one point from this match today. A look at the final standings shows just how close it was in the end. New Zealand and England clear of the pack with Canada and France making up the semi-final quartet. Scotland finished just outside the top four on points difference. So the semi-finals would match New Zealand against France while host Canada would face England. When we come back, it's semi-finals time. Could Le Bleu stop the Black Ferns juggernaut? And could the home crowd lift Canada to victory over England?